This is Becoming Anti-Fragile with I.J. McCann. Each week I read a book and highlight the actionable wisdom within. To become anti-fragile, you must strengthen your mind and live with conviction. Let's get into it. This idea of skin in the game is woven into history. Historically, all warlords and warmongers were warriors themselves and with a few curious exceptions, society were run by risk takers and not risk transfers. Prominent people took risks, considerably more risk than the ordinary citizens. The Roman Emperor Julian the Apostate died on the battlefield fighting in the never-ending war on the Persian frontier while emperor. One may only speculate about Julius Caesar, Alexander, and Napoleon, owing to the usual legend building by historians, but here the proof is stark. There is no better historical evidence of an emperor taking a frontline position in battle than a Persian spear lodged in his chest. One of his predecessors, Valerian, was captured on the same frontier and was said to have been used as a human footstool by the Persian Shapur when mounting his horse. And the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine the Eleventh Paleologus, was last seen when he removed his purple toga, then joined Ionus Dalmatis and his cousin, Theophilus, Paleologus to charge Turkish troops with their swords above their heads, proudly facing certain death. Yet legend has it that Constantine had been offered a deal in the event of a surrender. Such deals are not for self-respecting kings. This is an excerpt from Skid in the Game, Hidden Asymmetries in Daily Life by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. This book quickly rose to be one of my most recommended and one of my most purchased books. I have bought multiple copies for friends and given to them. I will go to bookstores and thrift stores to look for this book and surprisingly have found quite a few copies in thrift stores and have, have gotten it for way below market price. The reason that this book is number three is because it is a reminder to be willing to take the risk for the ideas, for the convictions that I have right? And not be a talker. To live a meaningful, worthy life, we have to become action oriented. And that means we have to also be willing to take the risks and not transfer the risk to somebody else or to something else, right? Whether that's advocating for training, martial arts, working out, giving financial advice, dietary advice, you know, you have to be willing to do the actual thing itself And if there are risks associated with whatever you've advocated for, then you have to be willing to bear those risks yourself and not transfer that risk to someone else. And something that I've continually advocated for uh, amongst friends is that they should pick up some form of martial art, whether that's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is what I practice and teach, or they do Muay Thai or boxing. The, The reason I preach this is because... I know how much it has impacted the way I live and the way I interact with the world and the way I interact with people. And I have also suffered the consequences of practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, namely that I have injured my ligaments. I continue to train because I find that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a mirror for how to live in this world. And it is analogous to having skin in the game because when you're training on the mats, when you're grappling somebody with 100% of your effort. There is the risk that you will get injured, but you have to be willing to take that risk to learn to grow and to gain that reward of learning how to do jiu-jitsu and learning how to overcome larger, stronger opponents. And on the mats, it is very difficult to BS your way through it. It is very difficult to BS your way into knowing techniques, into knowing moves, into knowing positions. Because when you get on the mat and somebody especially with a resisting opponent who also knows Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you can't BS your way through it all, right? If you do, you will often get submitted. And unsurprisingly, we've had people come through the academy who will claim that they've trained Jiu-Jitsu before or who claim that they did wrestling or whatever. They'll say they've, they've trained before. They'll come in, they'll take the class, and then you know, usually at the end of the class, the last 30, 20 minutes, we do an open roll, Right. Role meaning you spar. And it is at this time that you find out if the person claims to have trained before has actually trained before. And there have been times where people come in and with no training but have claimed it, have claimed that they've trained and they end up getting demolished. Their ego breaks. 
uh, their motivation breaks and sometimes they don't come back. Other times they do come back. Or at the end of the role, they'll say, oh yeah, I actually haven't trained. You know, I actually trained in the basement with my friends for like a few months. So this is a lesson for us to practice what we preach. We don't want to be the guy who claims to be able to do jiu-jitsu, to be able to do boxing. But then when the time comes to actually spar, it's revealed that we don't know anything. And training some form of sparring martial arts like Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, boxing, wrestling, they're one of the best ways to learn skin in the game because there to get the rewards of winning, to get the rewards of defeating somebody, you have to be willing to bear the risks. So going into this book, the idea of skin in the game has permeated through history and they've come up in different ways and different formulations. And one of them is the silver rule. The silver rule is different from the golden rule. And I quote, the golden rule wants you to treat others the way you would like them to treat you. The more robust silver rule says, do not treat others the way you would not like them to treat you. So while the golden rule advises treating others as you would like to be treated, the silver rule takes a slightly different approach. It's via negativa, right? Emphasizing the avoidance of harming people and of treating others as how you would not want to be treated. And so this idea of the silver rule is required, according to Taleb, to have a functioning civil society. So Taleb says, the very idea behind the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States is to establish a civil rule style symmetry. You can practice your freedom of religion so long as you allow me to practice mine. You have the right to contradict me so long as I have the right to contradict you. Effectively, there is no democracy without such an unconditional symmetry in the rights to express yourself. And the gravest threat is the slippery slope in the attempts to limit speech on the grounds that some of it may hurt some people's feelings. Such restrictions do not necessarily come from the state itself, rather from the forceful establishment of an intellectual monoculture by an overactive thought police in the media cultural life. So here we have this idea of via negativa. So this is a silver style symmetry because you do not treat others the way you would not like them to treat you. Think of how you do not want to be treated. Do not treat others in that way. The silver rule establishes a symmetry between people, whether that's in transaction, in relations uh, between nations. And one of the oldest form of this is the Hammurabi Code. Um, The Hammurabi is currently in the Louvre. It's got all these different laws on it if you can call it laws and the Hammurabi code establishes symmetry between people and in transactions so nobody can transfer hidden risks to other people or as Taleb calls it Bob Rubin style risks so an example from there is if an architect builds a building that kills the master then the architect must be put to death if the building kills the firstborn of the master then the architect's firstborn should perish another example is You know, if a man breaks into your house, they should kill him and hang him in front of that very breach. The idea here is you cannot walk away from the risks that you created, right? If you built a poorly designed building and it gets destroyed, then you can't just walk away from it. You have to bear the the consequences of it. You have to own the risk. And we need this silver rule in a civilized society to prevent people from engaging in harmful activities. He says, look, if you take suicide bombers, jihadis, For jihadis, for them, killing themselves will grant them 72 virgins in heaven. And so it's an honor for them to to die. Taleb suggests that something like the Hammurabi Code could be used to prevent jihadis and suicide bombers. Because for the suicide bombers, for them, the prize is to get the 72 virgins in heaven. And sometimes the families went for the work of their sons. Taleb says one way to prevent or disincentivize suicide bombers and jihadis is actually to make the family pay for the harms of the jihadi. So if you're a jihadi and you die, but nothing happens to your family, and your family are, say, somewhat compensated for it, then you will have more and more jihadis. However, if you want to prevent it from happening, you say, look, if you're a jihadi, you may not be here, but your family's going to suffer in some way, monetary or not. They'll suffer for your actions and the harm that you've caused the others. Taleb says this will likely prevent people from doing more acts of jihad. The interesting thing about the Hammurabi Code is that the the Old Testament is something similar, right? In Leviticus 24, 20, for example, it says fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. 
or Exodus 21, 23 to 25 says, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Again, the idea here is you cannot transfer risks knowingly and, and not pay the price that your actions cause others. Instead, you should be willing to bear the risk of your actions. Some of the people with the least amount of skin in the game are experts, those who seek prizes from their own peers, you know, chefs who cook for other chefs, academics who write for other academics, think tanks, policy advisors who advocate to look good amongst their peers, architects who design buildings for other architects to win awards for best design. Taleb's point is that if you are judged by your peers, then you have no contact in reality. Whereas if you take a profession like plumbers or electricians, a plumber does not fix the pipes for other plumbers to look at and to praise, but for the customer. An electrician does not fix the lights and the power to impress other electrician. They do it for their customer. He gives the example of Anatis, and I could be saying his name incorrectly, who is someone that Hercules defeats. But Anatis, but so long as Anatis was grounded to earth, to Gaia, his mother, he was undefeated. He had the strength. But the moment he lost connection, he lost all his power. So what happens is when Anatis and Hercules are wrestling, Hercules lifts him off the ground. And as a result, Anatis loses all his strength and Hercules crushes him. And, and to quote Taleb, you cannot separate knowledge from contact with the ground. Actually, you cannot separate anything from contact with the ground and contact with the real world is done via skin in the game, having exposure to the real world and paying a price for its consequences, good or bad. And in our modern society, we are filled with intellectuals, experts who don't suffer any of the consequences of their bad ideas. So he says, intellectualism is the belief that one can separate an action from the results of such action, that one can separate theory from practice, that one can always fix a complex system by hierarchical approaches that is in a ceremonial top-down manner. And he goes on to say, the curse of modernity is that we are increasingly populated by a class who are better at explaining than understanding. Right, so you have bureaucrats who will control the system and think that they can play gods. They'll advocate for policies that actually don't do any good, but they never have to engage in this world. So, so then they never really incur the damages of their own policies. An example of this would be politicians talk about the unaffordability of homes, but then continue advocating for zoning laws that make it more difficult for more houses to be built. And this doesn't impact them because they already have a multi-million dollar home. We have this rise in these class of people because we've placed a premium on intellectuals and what Taleb calls intellectuals yet idiots. And these are people who live divorced from reality itself, right? They live in their high towers and these are academics, bureaucrats. You know, if their ideas end up harming society, people, they're not penalized for it. And it might take years and years for it to happen. It might take 10, 20, 30 years. What's happening to universities today is not the result of something that happened yesterday, but something that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, right? Of these academics who had no real skin in the game, but were advocating for these dangerous ideologies, which ended up manifesting through their students and then students then became teachers. And then we are now suffering from it. The important concept for a skin in the game is symmetry between risk sharing and risk transferring. Taleb brings up uh, the GMO corporations who were producing hidden harm to communities and nobody really knew about it. There were some scientists who knew about it. And one scientist specifically he, who was a whistleblower, his name was Giles Eric Serralin. He's a French guy. But Serralin, when he came out and brought the truth to the public, his scientific findings were discredited. He himself was discredited and he lived in disgrace for a long time until he won his lawsuit. So think about that. He was willing to bear the risk of losing his credentials, losing in quotes amongst his peers, to stand up and to reveal the truth. And this is the epitome of having skin in the game versus the corporations who don't have any skin in the game. They produce the harm to the community, but nothing happens to them, right? If harm is being done by their product, they either pay people off, scientists off to, to confound the public or move the operation somewhere else and then repeat the same harm to a different community. The asymmetry is also seen in two examples that he provides. One is Bob Rubin, who is a banker who made millions and millions of dollars from the financial crash, or I should say leading up to the financial crash, and pilots, aircraft pilots. 
So we'll start with Bob Rubin. With Bob Rubin, you know, he makes $120 million leading up to the financial crash. He makes all this money. He has a house. When the crash happens, tons of people lose their money, lose their savings, lose their retirement funds. But then he comes out and says, hey, this was a black swan event. We could not have predicted it. And so what happens here is that the banks are rescued by the government from collapsing. When the intervention happens, you know, the governments are funded by your everyday person who's not a banker, right? These are your gym teachers, your coffee shop managers, your entrepreneurs, your yoga teachers. These are the ones who paid the price the ultimate price for the mistakes of Bob Rubin and his friends who continue to play with their money knowing that there was systemic risk but continue to do it because it benefited them. So there was this privatization of the upside and then when the whole thing crashed, there was a socialization of the downside. And here is the asymmetry. And this is not having skin in the game, right? If you had skin in the game, say for somebody like Bob Rubin, he would take all that $100 million that he earned and use that to help bail out the banks or give it to the retired high school teacher who lost their retirement fund. And people have a sense of other people when they don't have skin in the game and they benefit hugely from whatever it is that they're doing. So take, for example, entrepreneurs versus uh, public servants. No one in society will say we should cap the salaries or the profits of entrepreneurs. However, if we see a public servant get rich by serving the public, there's something not right about it. And in Switzerland, Taleb talks about how the Swiss tried to pass a bill to limit the salaries of public servants. Ultimately, it didn't go through, but the idea was that people intuitively know that getting rich off developing government policies and programs versus providing actual value to the to the public are very different things. Take the example now of an aircraft pilot where he is unable to transfer the risk onto his passengers like Bob Rubin did. Because if a pilot is flying a plane and crashes the plane, it's very difficult for him to transfer the risk of death to only the passengers and save himself, right? The the pilot suffers the consequence of the crash itself. Whereas if you have a pseudo pilot, somebody who only pretends to know, what ends up happening to him is he'll die because he doesn't know how to fly the plane. A similar concept applies to captains of ships, right? Captains of ships are supposed to be the last people to get off the ship. If it's sinking, if it's being attacked, they're the last person to get off because they are the captain. They are willing to go down with the ship in order to save others. Now, back in the 90s, there was a Korean captain who abandoned his ship with his crew um, as the ship was sinking. But they had told the passengers that there was nothing to worry about and to continue as they were. The passengers didn't know what was happening. And in the meantime, the captain and his crew member abandoned the ship. And that example makes you very upset and angry at somebody who would do this. And this is precisely somebody who doesn't have skin in the game. This book is not only about an incentive problem where you you know share the benefits, as often it is talked about in startup tech culture, right? The idea that, oh, you should have skin in the game by having equity. But the idea here, it's about symmetry. It's about having a share of the harm, paying a penalty if something goes wrong. That's what it is. And Taleb says this is the this is the ultimate BS detector because it's very difficult to escape the risk if you have skin in the game, right? You end up getting scarred from it. To give the example of a training martial arts, within the community, there's this there's a sense of respect given to people with cauliflower ears. And a cauliflower ear happens when there's a direct impact on the outer ear and the skin between your cartilage, the cartilage of your ear is filled up with blood. And over time, the blood hardens and then you get this disfigurement. And so there's a sense of respect given to people with cauliflower ears because it's seen as somebody who's gone through the trenches right, and who's willing to take the damage and bears the scar of having trained. And the thing with Jaws Eric Sorelin, the scientist whistleblower, was that he's willing to stick up for truth when it was unpopular. And even though it cost him his reputation, Taleb says it is far more virtuous to to stick up for the truth, even if you have to bear the, the harm from it. So when it comes to skin in the game, it's about willing to take the risk and not just the reward. And people, I find, are least courageous when the crowd is against them. People are unwilling to stand against the prevailing view, even if the prevailing view is wrong. 
people don't want to take the risk and have a dissenting view because then they might get abandoned by their friends. They might get canceled. Courage is easy when the majority is on your side. It's much harder to fake in reality. So people who are willing to be dissenters are the courageous ones, are the ones who have skin in the game. But in our society, most people don't have skin in the game. Most people will simply go with the times, with the prevailing view, and advocate for it without them having thought through whether they would actually stand for the, that position if push came to shove. So it is important. I think for you and I, courage is a message that we can take from this book, is willing to have courage and to stand up for our convictions and to bear the consequences of it. Talking about courage is different than having courage when the time actually comes. Let me give you an example. What would you do if you were coming out of a building and right beside you, you saw a man verbally and physically abusing a woman in the street in broad daylight? Would you intervene or would you continue to just pretend you didn't see and walk off? The sad part is the majority of people on that street that day, they were w watching the whole thing happen from across the street, from right next to these people, or they were just walking by and giving them a side eye. And nobody did anything. But most people, if you give them this, this situation, it's not a hypothetical situation, this happened a few years ago. If you ask them, what would you do? They would say, I would stand up for them. I would intervene and stop this abuse that's taking place. But this is where reality sets in and people don't actually intervene. Because if they did, somebody would have intervened before I came up and intervened. And simply in the act of intervening, other people came up behind me and joined and were willing to stand up. But prior to that, nobody did anything. You have to be willing to bear the potential risk for standing firm in your beliefs. That's the point of having skin in the game. But for me, I knew full well that in intervening, something could happen. But I wanted to stop the abuse that was taking place. And in simply going up and saying, hey, what's the issue here? The whole thing stopped. You just needed five words and the verbal and physical abuse would have stopped. And somebody could have done it minutes before I came up. Again, it's important for people to have skin in the game. When you're talking, advocating for ideas, advocating for policies, advocating for... You have to take the risk to enjoy the rewards. So when I was rereading this book, it reminded me of Leo Tolstoy's issue with his peers and the clergy of the Orthodox Church. Now Tolstoy, as you remember from episode 002, is a man who has everything, right? The house, the estate, 16,000, if you remember, 16,200 uh, acres of land in the Samara province in Russia. He has written War and Peace, Anna Karenina, and considered one of the greatest novels He's having these conversations with his aristocratic peers about life, and they all agree that life is meaningless and it's pointless. There is no difference between living and dying, that there is no difference between them you know, gaining more wealth and having less wealth. So then for Tolso, he says, well, if, there is, if life is meaningless, if that's what, it, what you truly believe, then why are you still alive? If there is no difference between life and death, why are you still alive? Since the most logical step, if life is meaningless, is to commit suicide. Right? That is the most rational and logical step, according to Tolstoy. But none of his aristocratic friends, including himself, ever commit suicide. And he and his inability to go through with the logical step of destroying his own life, it is what haunts him until he finds, until he finds the answer to the meaning of life. But up until then, he says, look... You, his aristocratic friends, and him are hypocrites. They go around preaching, talking to each other that life is meaningless, but then they don't actually live like life is meaningless. They live as if life is meaningful. They don't have any skin in the game. And, and the same thing is true of the clergy. Tolstoy says the clergy believed in scripture, believed in the Christian rule of life, but when it actually came to living life, the clergy's life were no different than Tolstoy's life. They were as debaucherous and lived as if life was meaningless. So this idea of skin in the game is crucially important for living a meaningful life. For it's only in the act of committing to our beliefs that we start to see the rewards of that belief, but also we build the courage to stand firm in the face of uncertainty and in the face of uh, the risk that comes with it. 
An example of somebody who didn't have skin in the game when it mattered was Napoleon. And Napoleon is considered a legend amongst historians, amongst business people. And this is because of his character, his relentless pursuit of his goals, his single-minded focus, his military and strategic acumen. But the thing is, Napoleon abandoned his soldiers twice. And most people don't know that. He abandoned soldiers in Egypt and then more tragically during the Russian campaign. Napoleon is a modern man, but if you look at the ancient rulers from the excerpt, for example, Julian the Apostate, right? he died on the battlefield. He died with his soldiers. He didn't run away when he thought he was going to lose. He went straight into the battlefield and died on the spear. So what we're seeing here is that skin in the game is something that is in history. It is in the way we act and live in the world. And so Taleb is simply just pulling it out, explaining more things to it. Now, there is a downside to skin in the game where if it is deployed in a very particular manner, it actually enslaves the person. So the example that Taleb gives is between a contractor and an employee. A, con a contractor is somebody you know who doesn't report to you, does the work, but has no skin in the game, whereas the employee reports to you and has skin in the game. And one of them is owned by the corporation, and that is the employee, right? It's the difference between dogs and wolves. So there's a story between a dog and a wolf, and the dog's telling the wolf about all the meals that he has, you know, everything's provided for him. And the wolf is getting quite enamored by this and is quite attracted to this lifestyle that the dog has. But then the wolf goes, what is that collar on your neck? And when the dog explains it, the wolf says, of all your meals, I want none. And the wolf runs away and he's still running away. So to quote, someone who has been employed for a while is giving you a strong evidence of submission. Evidence of submission is displayed by the employees going through years, depriving himself of his personal freedom for nine hours every day. His ritualistic, punctual arrival at an office, his denying himself of his own schedule, his not having beaten up anyone on the way back home after a bad day. He is an obedient, housebroken dog. The point that Taleb is making is employees are risk averse, whereas contractors or entrepreneurs are not risk averse and they have skin in the game. And that we should not be risk averse ourselves, that we should be, again, willing to bear the risk of our beliefs. And so he goes on to say this, entrepreneurs are heroes in our society. They fail for the rest of us. But owing to funding and current venture capital mechanism, many people mistaken for entrepreneurs fail to have true skin in the game in the sense that their aims is either cash out by selling the company that they help create it or to somebody else or go public. To make the example of having true skin in the game as entrepreneurs, you can take the most recent fiasco of WeWorks. WeWork is, as a company is failing. Their share prices have gone down dramatically. And they were considered a darling in the tech world. But even though WeWork is failing the and the companies that have invested in it have probably lost a ton of money, the founder, Adam Newman, is very, very wealthy, even though his company went bust. And this is an example of somebody who didn't have skin in the game and who didn't bear the risk of the company failing because you know he exited, he was bought out, he sold his shares as secondary sales. Whereas running a business that's not venture-backed and not in this bubble, you're able to tell the difference between somebody fully committed to the project that they're doing versus somebody who's just there to make money. And you can always sniff those out because faking skin in the game, you often tell because people will virtue signal. Another example is Sam Bagman fried of FTX. He has been found guilty of all seven charges, potentially facing 117 years in prison for the financial fraud, you know. And he's the classic example of somebody faking skin in the game and virtue signaling pretty much all the time leading up to him actually being caught he said there's nothing to worry about and then when asked hey why are you making all this money what you know why do you want to make as much money as possible he said oh because i want to help people personally anytime somebody says that they're making all this money for altruistic reasons it's a red flag for me same with the whole notion of effective altruism it's a red flag for me and what we end up finding with sam Fried was that he was using customer funds to essentially gamble and using those funds to give money to political parties that helped. He was buying politicians with the money. They gave money to, say, the Democratic Party, millions and millions of dollars, which are customer funds. He gave them away as if it was his 
a lot of the customers lost tons and tons of money. But the Democratic Party does not have to give those millions and millions of dollars back because they've used it all. Very similar to Bob Rubin. He gets $120 million. The crash happens. And who has to bail out the banks? It is your coffee shop barista. It is your gym teacher. It is the high school history teacher. The, they're the ones who have to bail it out. And in the case of FTX crashing, the customers aren't going to get their money back. Another example of risk transferring that we are too well aware of that our society wholly accepts without question is liberal arts to an extent some stems now because these 18 17 year olds are going into hundred thousand dollar debts without the knowledge or sometimes with the knowledge but being duped by their teachers into believing that they need to have this degree to go on to get a paying job and this is a form of risk transferring that's happening because the professors are teaching these students these ideas especially in liberal arts education knowing full well that these students are going to graduate with a ton of debt with a low probability of getting a high paying job and so then these professors don't bear any of that risk that their students are taking when they go out and neither do the universities the universities know full well too that they're only there to cash grab and so they will promote the heck out of their programs how great their liberal arts are but in reality the only person that gets the butt end of this whole education deal is the students and the parents maybe right they're the ones who lose out the ones who benefit right who are able to get the rewards without the risk are the professors who are tenured with cozy salary so they never really have to think about the risk that they're transferring to their students so what is then happening is the you know, the institutions in partnerships with the professor are creating modern day slaves for corporations now faking skin in the game in the wild is quite interesting so taleb gives the example of a hair of sparrows where and i quote males develop secondary traits that correlate with their fighting ability Darker color is associated with dominance. However, experimental darkening of lighter males does not raise their status because their behavior is not altered. In fact, these darker birds get killed. As the research Terry Burnham once told me, birds know that you need to walk the walk. And that is what we're getting at. You have to walk the walk. You have to practice what you preach. But in our society... It's easy to hide behind fake virtue signaling through Instagram posts, through changing your status to a particular flag. Now, people do all of these fake virtue signalings because on the internet, there's very little consequences. Right? Nobody's going to come and challenge you to a duel. Nobody's going to come and fight with you through the internet. There are a lot of keyboard warriors, of course, but what they say to you on the internet is very different from somebody coming up to you and challenging you because of your signaling on a particular topic. And so this lack of consequences attached to what people say and do has made it the case that, that there's a rise in virtue signaling. However, corporations are the best at this. They'll put up certain flags during a certain month, but then the rest of the month, they don't care about it. They'll do business in countries that are known for human rights violation. And they will not pull out of these countries because it makes them money, right? They have no skin in the game, nothing. But people are easily fooled by this because they themselves are faking skin in the game. The people who are against it, the people who are willing to take the stance, don't shop at these places, can sniff out these virtueless corporations, the shillers of these corporations. You know, you and I need to have skin in the game. We have to be willing to follow our conscience, which very, very few people do in our modern day. Now, Taleb talks about something interesting that I had never really thought about in this particular way. It's the idea of Christ having to be fully man. So within Christian theology, Jesus Christ has to be fully man and fully God. Emphasizing only one versus the other puts you in the camp of some sort of heretic. And Taleb's point is that the reason the third century Christians emphasized Christ being fully man was because God needed to actually suffer on the cross, sacrifice himself and experience death. He had to have skin in the game because, in quote, 
a god stripped of humanity cannot have skin in the game in such a manner and cannot really suffer because the whole message of christianity is that jesus christ is god fully god fully man he takes upon the sins of the world dies on the cross on behalf of the world and becomes the sacrificial lamb if christ was not fully man or fully god this wouldn't have been possible so it is was important for christ to bear the risks of his claims as Taleb writes to summarize, in a Judeo-Christian place of worship, the focal point where the priest stands symbolizes skin in the game. The notion of belief without sacrifice, which is tangible proof, is new in history. The strength of a creed did not rest on evidence of the powers of its gods, but evidence of the skin in the game on the part of its worshippers. The point here is belief without sacrifice is simply cowardice. Become action-oriented. Don't tell people what you do. Show them what you do. And this is an important part of having skin in the game. As Celeb says, a Spartan mother tells her departing son, with it or on it, meaning either return with your shield or don't come back alive. Only cowards throw away their shields to run faster. If you want to consider how modernity has destroyed some of the foundations of human value, contrast the above unconditionals with modernistic accommodations. People who say, work for disgusting lobbies, or knowingly play the unusual, unethical academic game, come to grips with their condition by c producing arguments such as, I have children to put through college. People who are not morally independent tend to fit their ethics to their profession, rather than a profession that fits their ethics. Wow. I mean, that is spot on. It describes our modern world so well. There are tons of people who will say, who know full well that the work that they do is BS, that it's doing more harm to the society at large, but will continue to do it instead of looking for something else because of precisely these type of reasons, right? They fit their ethics around their profession instead of finding a profession that actually works with their ethics. Again, you have to be willing to bear the risks of your stance. If you have if you're advocating for a particular ethical framework, but you're not willing to take that stance yourself, then you shouldn't be advocating for that stance. Similar to somebody, a philosopher who advocates for the death of humanity to save the planet, but continues to breathe is not somebody you take seriously because they don't have skin in the game. If they did, you know exactly what they have to do. Two last important things to bear in mind with skin in the game is this idea of the rule of the minority. And... Taleb here wants to show the potential power of asymmetric relationships between things, specifically between uh, groups. Much The most intolerant ends up winning, you know, because they have the most skin in the game. Two examples here are peanuts and uh, vegans. And then the other two are kosher and halal laws. And with vegans and peanuts, you have peanut-free schools, peanut-free airplanes, peanut-free because people with peanut allergies, right, cannot be around peanuts. Whereas people who don't have peanut allergies can be around peanuts and also be in a pre peanut free place. And so what ends up happening is the what ends up happening is you end up creating a peanut free society because there is a very small minority that's sort of intolerant to peanuts, obviously, because some of them can die. But as Taleb points out, having a peanut free society actually makes this whole epidemic worse. Take, for example, the vegans too. If you have one vegan in the family and refuses to eat any sort of meat products and dairy products, the whole family will end up unwillingly converting and creating vegan meals because it's easier to create one meal than two separate meals of vegan and non-vegan. So then you take one person in a family of four who's vegan. The next thing you know, the, the family is now vegan. But now when the family goes to family reunion, the larger family at large will end up converting, not converting, but will end up making vegan meals because these people can't eat non-vegetarian and it's much easier to only make one type of meal than two types of meal. This impacts the society at large. You know, maybe there's more vegan choices that comes through the grocery stores. Same with kosher and halal laws, right? Kosher and halal laws are very similar. So when you go to grocery stores, you'll find certain meats will say halal, some will say kosher. And the reason for it is that the Jews and the Muslims cannot eat non-halal, non-kosher food. But people who are neither Jew nor Muslim can eat halal and kosher food. So then if it doesn't cut into the profits of the corporations too much, then 
they'll simply just make everything kosher and halal, which is starting to happen. So it's a stubbornness of the minority that creates changes in the society. And there is a interesting point that Taleb makes that it's it's only 3% of the population that's required to bring changes. And he says, revolutions are unarguably driven by an obsessive minority and the entire growth of society, whether economic or moral, comes from a small number of people. The last point from today that I wanted to mention is this idea of Lindy. And Lindy is uh, based off this restaurant uh, known for its cheesecake, but then it went bust during, actually, when this book was published, the restaurant went bust. But the idea was that the actors, play actors, discovered when they were at this restaurant, if a Broadway play survived for 200 days, then the, it'll survive for 200 more days. And if it survived for 500 days, then it'll survive for 500 more days. And so it became known as the Lindy effect. The, the idea of Lindy is applicable to books, to technology, to ideas. And so there are technologies that will last 100, 200, 1,000 more years versus ideas that are completely new and novel that might not even last the next 10, 20 years. Something simple as forks and spoons, for example, have lasted for thousands of years and will likely last for thousands of more years, even though you have something like sporks, which is a combination of forks and spoons, a very new and novel idea, but likely will not last. Whereas books... A book that has lasted for 10, 20 years will last for 10, 20 more years. If it lasts for 100 years, then it lasts for 100 more years. If it lasts for 200 years, 200 more years. So you have, and this is why ancient texts continue to have an impact and will likely continue to have an impact for another 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years until the last human civilization. And this is because of the Lindy effect. And so Taleb attempts to write his book in this manner where it can be read by generations after. I think about the Lindy effect because for you and I, we want to live virtuous lives. We want to live lives that our children can look up to, that we lived good, virtuous lives. And we want to be able to pass on the values that has been passed on to us from our parents who got it from their parents who got it from their parents. And I'll wrap with that. I think everybody should read this book, Skin in the Game by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. I'll put a link in the description to go get it. Let me know what you thought about this episode. Uh, leave a comment. If you're on Spotify, you can leave a comment. Otherwise, you can find me on Instagram, IJMcCon, or on Twitter with the same handle, IJMcCon. And finally, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps a lot. Helps other people find this podcast. And if you enjoy this podcast, share it with your friends. Till next week. Peace.